will demonstrate basic acoustical principles using ultrasonic scale models. Acoustical modeling using ultrasonic technology has been the subject of research at the University of Florida for over 10 years. We are using instrumentation developed by Grozier Technical Systems in Brookline, Massachusetts. This includes a high voltage spark source which produces an omnidirectional spherical sound wave of very high intensity. The pulse encompasses a fairly broad band of energy with many frequency components. From the source, the sound will move uniformly in all directions. It will be picked up by a small microphone. It's a one-tenth inch diameter Bolt Baranek and Newman microphone that receives the signal. An amplifier will increase the level of the sound so it can be processed. And a processor will take the logarithm and square the signal so that it comes out as decibels and is displayed on a digital storage oscilloscope. We are currently working to digitize this entire process, which will ultimately make the system much more user-friendly. There are a number of basic acoustical phenomena related to buildings that can be illustrated very effectively using scale modeling. In any architectural model, the linear dimensions of the prototype or full-size room are reduced by the selected scale factor of the model. For example, if we were to build a model at a scale of 1 to 10 or 1 tenth full size, a wall that was 10 feet long in the full size room would be built 1 foot long in the model. As the dimensions of the room are reduced in the model, the frequency and wavelength of sound must be scaled as well. So the sound waves travel the same number of cycles between surfaces in the model room as in the full size room. In a model that is 1 tenth full size, the frequency would be increased by a factor of 10. This would result in wavelengths being reduced by a factor of 10. For example, a sound with a frequency of 1,000 hertz in a full-size room with a wavelength of 1.13 feet would become a sound with a frequency of 10,000 hertz with a wavelength of 0.113 feet in our scale model. Similarly, events that occur in time are also reduced by the scale factor of the model. Sound travels the same velocity in the scale model as it does in the full-size room. The distance between the source of sound and the receiver has been reduced by the scale factor of the model. The sound waves in the scale model will thus arrive at the microphone in one-tenth of the time that they took to arrive in the full-size room. We're going to be measuring both very short periods of time and very high frequencies. We'll now proceed with a series of demonstrations of basic acoustical principles using scale models and ultrasonic test equipment. The first demonstration will be a free field sound decay. A free field is a situation where there are no surfaces to reflect sound. Sound will decay approximately six decibels with every doubling of distance from the source in a free field. We start with a microphone located 1.13 feet from the spark wand. This is equivalent to approximately one millisecond of sound travel. Sound travels approximately 1,130 feet per second. One millisecond is one one thousandth of a second. The tabletop is covered with sound absorbent material. Two separate traces are shown on the graph. One is the envelope of the pulse. This is the reflectogram showing the amplitude and arrival time of each sound wave. In this example, we see only one pulse arriving at the microphone. This is the direct sound. This is the sound that travels through the air directly from the sound source to the microphone. It has an amplitude measured in decibels. It arrives one millisecond after the processor has been triggered due to the distance between the spark source and the microphone. In this case, we only see a direct sound because the absorbent material on the tabletop has absorbed the sound that would have been reflected from that surface. The horizontal line on the graph shows the integrated energy level of the pulse also measured in decibels. This is the total energy in the pulse at a given point in time. Any quantitative measurements of energy levels are made by reading the distance of the integrated energy curve from the baseline, not from the peak of the reflectogram. Now we'll move the microphone. The distance from the spark source to the microphone has been increased to 2.26 feet. Notice the height of the pulse has decreased somewhat. 
and the integrated energy level is six decibels less than in the previous example. The pulse arrives two milliseconds after the trigger now as well. As we double the distance between the spark source and the microphone, we observe that the increase in time it takes for the sound to arrive at the microphone, as well as the six decibel decrease in sound level. Now I'll pick up the microphone and move it again. The distance from the source to the microphone has been doubled again to 4.52 feet. Notice that the pulse begins to rise at 4 milliseconds after the trigger now. The integrated energy level shown by the horizontal line has decreased 6 more decibels, and the pulse is also visually smaller than in the previous example. The basic principle of free field sound decay is that as one doubles the distance from the sound source, the sound level decreases by 6 decibels. This is due to the increasing area that the sound wave is spreading over. Our next demonstration will be of the absorption and reflection of sound. The absorbent material has been removed from the tabletop. The microphone has been located approximately 3.39 feet from the spark source now and the heights of the microphone and spark source have been adjusted so that the pulse that is reflected off the table will reach the microphone at a 45 degree angle. Now there are two pulses shown on the oscilloscope. The first is the direct sound pulse as in the previous example. The second is the pulse that is reflected off the table. The reflected pulse also has a lower peak there is a 2 to 3 decibel reduction or attenuation due to the increase in path length. There is virtually no attenuation offered by absorption at the surface. Notice also that the horizontal line jumps up at the location of the reflected pulse. This is adding the energy of the reflected pulse into the total energy of the impulse. The jump is approximately 2 to 3 decibels. This illustrates the addition of decibels. The energy level of the two pulses results in a total level that is 2 to 3 decibels higher than the initial pulse. It is not double the initial level. Now, let's place the piece of absorbent material back on the tabletop, keeping the source and the microphone in the same relative positions. The integrated energy level shown by the horizontal line and the peak of the reflected pulse are both noticeably lower than in the previous example due to the absorption at the surface. Using the processor, it's possible to delay the start of the trace until just after the arrival of the direct sound. This will allow us to record just the reflected pulse. The difference between the integrated energy levels for the two conditions allows one to calculate the absorption coefficient, alpha, at 45 degree angle of incidence for the absorbent material. Now we'll replace the absorbent material with a pile of diffusing material. These are odd shaped angled pieces of cardboard that will scatter the sound as opposed to create a specular reflection. Notice that there is not a single reflection from the tabletop now. Rather, there are a whole series of lower level reflections that occur over a rather long period of time. These smaller reflections travel different paths to arrive at the microphone. This is the scattering of sound from the small surfaces that lie at various angles to the source and the receiver. The sound is reflected from all of the surfaces in different directions instead of in a single concentrated reflection from the bare tabletop. The overall integrated energy level may or may not be equal to the level recorded in the example with a single strong reflection. The final level depends on the exact geometric relationship between the diffusing surfaces and the microphone. Some of the sound could be reflected towards the microphone that was previously previously reflected away from it, or vice versa. This would depend on the exact configuration of our pile. Our next demonstration will cover the use of sound barriers and diffraction. 
The microphone is still 3.39 feet from the spark source. The reflectogram shows the arrival of the direct sound pulse and the pulse that is reflected off the tabletop. The integrated energy level steps up at the arrival of the reflection, adding the energy of the reflection to that of the direct pulse. Now we'll insert a chipboard barrier halfway between the spark source and the microphone. The barrier just barely breaks the acoustic line of sight between the source and receiver. There's now only one pulse that arrives. The reflected pulse has been blocked by the barrier. Notice that there is a slight change in the arrival time of the pulse as well due to the increased path the sound wave travels as it bends or diffracts over the top of the barrier. There's also a slight decrease in energy level as shown by both the decrease in the integrated energy curve and the lower height of the pulse. Now, we'll insert a higher barrier between the spark and the microphone. There is a significant reduction in integrated energy level and a longer delay in the arrival time of the pulse. It would be possible through numerous iterations of this problem especially with complex geometries that might arise in the planning of a highway noise barrier to reduce the levels in the outdoor spaces of a housing complex. By moving the microphone and the source relative to each other, one can check the effectiveness the barrier might have at different locations very quickly. Comparisons with actual results and calculated values could quickly show the effectiveness of the barriers. Flanking transmission can be illustrated by simply lifting the barrier slightly off the ground. The change in arrival time and level can be readily observed as the size of the crack is varied. Of course, this principle extends to flanking transmission in rooms as well. We've moved both the spark and the microphone. We're going to look at the sound buildup process in a room. The spark source is located in what will become the center of one wall of the room, and the microphone is located in a corner that's diagonally opposite. A plywood room will be built one wall at a time around the microphone and the sound source. This is to show how each surface in the room will affect the acoustical response. This series of demonstrations will define the concept of a reflectogram. A reflectogram shows the relative amplitude and the time of arrival of the direct sound, which is the sound wave that travels through the air from the spark source to the microphone, and all of the subsequent reflections from the room's surfaces that result when a room is excited by an impulse. This is a graphic representation of the response of the room to an impulse. This type of test is similar in principle to a doctor looking at an electrocardiogram, the pulsing of your heart. He makes diagnoses about your health from looking at the way your heart pulses. An acoustician can look at reflectograms from a room showing the, its acoustical response and make diagnoses about the acoustical qualities of the room. We've placed a sheet of sound reflective material on the ground to act as the floor of the room. The first reflectogram shows a direct sound and the single reflected pulse that arrive when only the floor is in place. We've added a single wall to the room now the wall opposite the sound source. There are four individual reflections now. The first arrival is still the direct pulse. 
The second is the reflection off the floor. The third is a reflection off the wall. The fourth pulse is a reflection from the floor to the wall to the microphone. Notice how the energy level increases with the arrival of each successive pulse. The increases in sound level are added logarithmically rather than algebraically. If the reflection was equal in energy to the, to the direct sound, the increase would be only three decibels. We could detect where the second and third pulses are coming from by covering the floor with absorbent material. and firing the spark again. The reflection from the wall would still be on the trace. The wall could also be covered with absorbent material. Then the pulse would be significantly diminished. An alternative way to reveal the existence of the two pulses would be to shorten the time base on the oscilloscope. This would enlarge the horizontal distance between the pulses on the trace. A second wall has been added to the room now. There are now eight individual reflections on the trace. The direct sound is followed by reflections off the floor, off the first wall, off the second wall, off the combination of the first wall and the floor, the combination of the second wall and the floor, the combination of the two walls together, and the combination of the first wall to the second wall to the floor. Each reflection travels a slightly longer path to reach the microphone, so it reaches it with a slightly longer time delay. The amplitude of each reflection is also slightly less than the one which preceded it because of the increased attenuation due to path length and the additional absorption at the boundaries due to multiple reflections. A third wall has been added to the room now. There are now a series of multiple reflections between the two parallel surfaces. This is called flutter echo. The walls act as acoustical mirrors. This is comparable to the visual image of standing in a pizza parlor with rows of mirrors lining the two long parallel walls. You can look back and see an infinite series of reflected images in the mirror. The sound produces an infinite series of reflected acoustical images, which we hear repeated many times as the sound decays in the room. Each pulse train is slightly reduced in amplitude from the one preceding it due to the increase in path length. The shape of the repeated pulses is characteristic of flutter echo as well. This creates a very difficult condition for hearing in the room. There are several ways this problem can be remedied. The first is to splay one of the walls slightly. Notice in this graph that the first series of pulses is still re relatively strong. The subsequent pulses have been reduced in both amplitude and quantity by eliminating the parallelism between the walls. Another way to solve this problem is by putting absorbent material on one of the walls. In this instance, all of the reflected pulses are reduced in amplitude. Other solutions to this problem would include adding smaller patches of absorbent material on several of the walls, or by using smaller surface irregularities to diffuse and scatter the sound. A fourth wall has been added to the room now. This could be viewed as a room that has reflective walls with a totally absorbent ceiling, or as an upside down room where the ceiling is reflective and the absorbent audience is on the roof. There is now flutter in both directions. Notice that the flutter trains have two peaks and are separated by rather distinct gaps. This is not a diffuse sound field. The flutter builds up in two dimensions. The integrated energy level is also increasing even at the end of the pulse. This is indicative of the acoustical quality of a four-wall racquetball court with an open ceiling. A reflective ceiling has been added to the room now.
The time scale on the oscilloscope has been doubled as well so that there is twice as much time shown in this reflectogram as in the previous examples. Now there are flutter echoes in all three dimensions. There are multiple reflections among all the surfaces. Notice that the energy level is still increasing at the end of the trace at a significant rate. This is indicative of the acoustical quality of a gymnasium, a swimming pool, or a shower stall. It would tend to be excessively loud with too much reverberation. Speech intelligibility would be difficult to achieve in a room such as this. Envision this scenario. You're working in an architect's office. The sound absorbent material salesman comes in and suggests that you use a large quantity of sound absorbent material to cover one of the surfaces in the room to alleviate its acoustical problems. His solution would produce the reflectogram similar to the one in the previous example when we didn't have the ceiling installed in the model. The noise level in the reverberant field wasn't reduced very much, and the acoustical defects caused by the parallel surfaces are still present. This example points out the shortcomings of trying to solve all acoustical problems by only adding absorbent materials in rooms. The large volume of the room and all the parallel reflective surfaces must be dealt with in different ways. As a class exercise, it would be possible to have students build a model of a room such as this and try several alternative ways to solve the acoustical defects. In the next series of demonstrations, we're going to work towards gradually building the acoustical response of a theater. We're starting with a plywood box that has the same dimensions as the room that we just built. We have one end of it that is a proscenium opening with a stage house and another area that represents the audience seating. The microphone is located in the center of what will become the balcony. The spark source is located just under the proscenium arch. The model was built to represent an existing 1500 seat multi-purpose proscenium theater at a 1 to 40 scale. Notice the strong echo shown by the high spike that arrives quite late in the reflectogram. A basic exercise involves locating the surface that causes the echo. In acoustical models, this can be done in several ways. The first would involve covering each of the surfaces, such as the rear wall and the side wall, with absorbent materials one at a time and seeing which one removes the echo when the spark is fired. Another method would involve measuring the difference in path length between each reflected pulse and the direct sound and dividing this distance measured in feet by the 1.13 feet per millisecond that sound travels to determine which surface would reflect a pulse that arrives with the given time delay. This computation could be verified by covering the surface with absorbent material and testing as described above. For example, the rear wall of the auditorium in this case is about three feet from the spark. The distance the sound would travel from the spark to the rear wall to the microphone is a little less than four feet. The direct sound path between the spark and the microphone is about two feet. The difference in path between the two then is two feet as well there should be a two millisecond time delay between the direct sound and a reflection off of the rear wall of the auditorium. Now we've added a plywood ceiling over the model. There's a significant increase in the reflections that arrive at the listener's position in this example compared to the previous one. The integrated energy level is also much higher than in the previous example. The volume of this enclosure is actually somewhat smaller than the volume of the plywood room we constructed earlier due to the peculiar configuration of the stage house and the reduced ceiling height over the audience area. This is why both the integrated energy level 
and the amplitude of the reflections in the theater are less than in the plywood room example. A sloped floor has been added to the interior of the model and a balcony as well. The floor is covered with absorbent material to represent the audience in their seats. The added absorption results in a decrease in reverberant energy, evidenced by a decrease in the amplitude of the later reflections. The integrated energy level has also decreased somewhat. Notice that the reflections are starting to decay near the end of the reflectogram. The microphone position was changed slightly in this test as well. The microphone is now located in the center of the balcony. Two inserts have been added in the model now on the side walls. They've moved the side walls closer to the center of the audience seating. This will reduce the initial time delay gap somewhat. The initial time delay gap is the difference in arrival time between the direct sound and the first reflection. We're going to reduce the ceiling height as well. We're going to add a three and a half inch deep flat ceiling insert into the room. This will bring some of the reflections arriving at a much closer time than in the previous examples. Notice that the later reflections in the integrated energy level have both decreased again as a result of the decrease in room volume. The initial time delay gap has also been shortened slightly. Two angled reflecting panels have been added to the ceiling insert now. These panels were designed to cast reflections across the seating area by ray diagramming techniques. Notice that four major reflections arrive at the microphone from these two panels. We can illustrate this point using a narrow strip of wood and placing it across the model in the plane of the ceiling. Each panel actually casts two individual reflections to the microphone. Not one as might be projected from a ray diagram. This results from the leading and trailing edge of what is actually a spherical sound wave that is reflected from the ceiling as opposed to the single ray. Sound actually travels as spherical waves, not the rays that we typically use to illustrate sound travel. As we move the strip of wood along the face of the panel, we can see very definite reflections arriving from the two different locations at two different arrival times. Now we've added a highly articulated ceiling to the model to improve diffusion. There are several large curved surfaces on the ceiling as well as a series of irregularities and lighting coves. There's an abrupt drop in the amplitude of the early reflections, which should be, quote, filled in by additional reflections. Notice also that taking away the flat reflecting panels from the ceiling, the number of large discrete reflections arriving shortly after the direct sound has been reduced. Diffuse sidewalls have been added to the model now.
we observe a relatively smooth decay of sound in the room. It's beginning to become a reasonably articulate environment that compares favorably with other rooms of similar size that are used for speech in theater. In our last case, we have a very articulate and highly detailed model of an existing theater that's built. We've gradually built up to this very detailed model, step by step, starting with a simple rectangular box with all parallel surfaces and gradually adding each acoustical element until we have now a full theater. We see a relatively smooth decay of sound in the room in our balcony position. There are several significant reflections that arrive shortly after the direct sound from the ceiling. These reflections would reinforce the direct sound by increasing the loudness as we move towards the rear of the room. There is a smooth decay and sufficient reverberation to provide for intelligible speech. The sound falls off rapidly enough to have sufficient clarity and articulation as well. The reflectogram in the model room is compared to the reflectogram at the equivalent location in the full-size room in this slide. Notice the similarity between the two. If the theater is to accommodate several purposes, an orchestral shell may be used. This will allow the musicians to hear each other as they play and also to project the sound from the musicians out through the audience. Notice the increase in the early reflections in the reverberant energy to make the room more lively for musical performances. In the progressive development of the room, once the room volume and the audience absorption were added to the model, the integrated energy level remained the same in all the examples that followed. However, the changes to the interior surfaces of the room significantly altered the way in which the energy was distributed over time and throughout the room. This is essential for us to realize as architects. As we change the shape of rooms, we change their perceived acoustical qualities. The room volume is often fixed by the number of people to be housed in the room in the project budget. Design development often occurs within a given enclosure. I hope that we've illustrated the ability of acoustical modeling to show the changes in the acoustical response of a room as one makes changes to the design of the room. This shows the ability of ultrasonic modeling to give designers feedback on the acoustical consequences of their decisions relative to shape and aesthetic design of interior spaces. Once the room volume and the absorbance surfaces were fixed, the reverberation time was essentially the same for all of the subsequent cases in the development of this theater. And yet, as we've seen, we change the nature of the acoustical response rather dramatically from the first experiment in this sequence to the last. I hope this series of experiments has helped to clarify the response of rooms to sound. We've tried to illustrate very important but very basic concepts in architectural acoustics. The research that we're continuing to do in this area is helping to develop a scientific basis for the acoustical design of rooms which is essential if progress in this field is to occur.